Department of Justice, and Mrs. F S. Elizabeth Birnbaum, the Director of the Minerals Management Service, U.S. Department of Interior. Dr. Lachemko here? I don't see her. Okay, we'll, we'll proceed with the panel. Uh, Rear Admiral James Watson, welcome. Thank you for your service. Good afternoon, Chairman Ray Hall. Uh, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the ongoing response to the explosion and subsequent oil spill from the mobile uh, offshore drilling unit, Deepwater Horizon. Since the night of the explosion, federal, state, and local authorities and the responsible parties, BP and Transocean, have been working around the clock to secure the leak and mitigate environmental damages. My role as the Deputy Federal On-Scene Coordinator and to support uh, Rear Admiral Mary Landry, who is our 8th District Commander out of New Orleans, uh, and the FOSC at the Area Command level in Roberts, Louisiana, is management and oversight of all response operations. The Deepwater Horizon explosion on the night of April 20th set off an unfortunate chain of events. The event began as a search and rescue case. Within the first few hours of the explosion, 115 of the 126 crew members were safely recovered. After three days of continuous searching, the Coast Guard suspended the search for the 11 missing crew members. My deepest sympathies go to the families and the friends of those crew members who lost their lives in the line of duty. A massive oil spill response following the sinking of the Deepwater Horizon. Unprecedented in its scope, complexity, and indeterminate nature, the spill has required an extraordinary unified response across all levels of government, industry, and the communities of five coastal states uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. An incident command system was quickly established to coordinate this massive operation, employing lessons learned from the Exxon Valdez, the Costco Busan, and spill of national significant exercises. Through the implementation of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, the response community galvanized their efforts under the common framework provided by the National Contingency Plan. This framework, developed over the last two decades, enables us to respond to these catastrophes in a way that leverages the strengths of private industry under the leadership of a federal on-scene coordinator. In accordance with the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, we integrated the best federal, state, and local resources alongside the best and brightest minds of industry, academia, and the public in a unity of effort to protect our natural resources, livelihoods, and the security of the nation. The federal government has taken an all-hands-on-deck approach from the moment the explosion occurred, including the designation of a spill of national significance and designated Admiral Thad Allen as the National Incident Commander. From the start, our objectives have remained constant. Stop the leak, fight the spill offshore, protect environmentally sensitive areas, and mitigate the effects on the environment, the economy, and the local communities. Despite several aggressive measures, including the top hat and the riser insertion tube tool, engineers have been unable to stop the flow of oil. Today, we eagerly await the outcome of BP's deployment of the top kill to the well's blowout preventer. As of uh, this morning, this complex uh, operation is still scheduled to be conducted. Um, they are executing the last minute diagno diagnostics to ensure the systems are in place given the inherent risk associated with this first-of-a-kind operation. Uh, once top kill commences, the process ex is expected to take three to four days to complete. Um, in parallel, BP is continuing to drill relief wells from two additional rigs. I personally meet with BP officials and know they are working around the clock to secure this source. While we work to permanently secure the leak, we are also attacking the spill as far offshore as possible. As the oil moves from one large monolithic lift slick to multiple pools of oil, uh, we continue to deploy traditional methods including surface dispersants, in situ burning, and surface cleanup equipment. However, the magnitude and dynamic nature of the spill has required us to look at non-traditional mitigation response strategies. The use of subsurface dispersants and satellite imagery uh, to uh, help 
direct this movement of the skimmers and the burning are just a few examples of innovative technologies as new approach, approaches to uh, responding offshore. In addition to our offshore efforts, we continue to deploy nearshore measures to protect pre-designated environmentally sensitive areas as outlined in our area contingency plans. This includes different types of booms and other non-conventional barrier methods, including uh, National Guard's deployment of HESCO barriers in Mississippi and their sandbags in Louisiana. As oil reaches the shoreline, we have seen in Louisiana over the last few, several days, uh, that, and we continue to monitor the responsible party's actions. We are requiring BTP to obtain and deploy whatever resources are necessary, including new technologies, to ensure we are doing everything we can to protect the shoreline and the environmentally sensitive areas in the Gulf region. Mitigating the effects of this spill extend beyond environmental impacts and include damages to surrounding communities who depend on the Gulf of Mexico for their livelihood. The fishermen and small business owners are anxious to do whatever they can. Recognizing the desire of so many to help and support the local economies, the Unified Command has established a volunteer and vessel of opportunity program to maximize the opportunities available to the local communities to support response and cleanup operations. Although the incident remains under investigation by a joint Minerals Management Service and Coast Guard Marine Board of Investigation, it may take months before we fully understand what caused the explosion. However, the spill has highlighted the need for building resiliency into our nation's critical infrastructure so we are better prepared to respond to system failures and prevent spills of national significance. Our response to this historic spill is far from over. I want to ensure you that the entire response community is fully committed and will continue to aggressively pursue all available options to mitigate the environmental and economic impacts from this spill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Dr. Lubchenco, welcome once again to our committee. Thank you, Chairman Rahal and members of the committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, about the Department of Commerce's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's role in the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. I wish to begin by letting the families of the 11 people who lost their lives in the explosion and sinking of the Deepwater Horizon know that we think about them every day. The 12,800 employees of NOAA, both those who are actively working in the Gulf as well as those around the country, extend our deepest condolences to them. Because you already have my written testimony, what I'd like to do today is just summarize briefly NOAA's overall uh, responsibilities in this effort and then give you a brief update of where we are with some uh, more recent uh, happenings. <clears throat> NOAA's mission is to understand and predict changes in Earth's environment to conserve and manage coastal and marine resources to meet our nation's economic, social, and environmental needs. NOAA is also a natural resource trustee and is one of the federal agencies responsible for protecting and restoring the public's coastal natural resources when they are affected by oil spills. As such, the entire agency is deeply concerned about the immediate and long-term environmental, economic, and social impacts to the Gulf Coast and the nation as a whole in response to this oil spill. NOAA is the nation's scientific resource for the unified command and is responsible for coordinated scientific weather and biological response services. Our experts have been assisting with the response from the very outset. Offices throughout the agency have been mobilized and hundreds of NOAA personnel are dedicating themselves to assist. Over the past few weeks, NOAA has provided 24-7 scientific support to the U.S. Coast Guard in its role as federal on-scene coordinator both on the scene and through our Seattle Operations Center. <clears throat> this NOAA-wide support includes twice daily trajectories of the spilled oil, information management, overflight observations and mapping, weather and river flow forecasts, shoreline and resource risk assessment, and oceanographic modeling support. Now for a few updates on seven activities for which NOAA has responsibility. Number one, NOAA oceanographers continue to release updated oil trajectory maps showing the predicted trajectory of oil slick. These maps help inform shoreline operations, placement of boom, and oil recovery efforts at the surface. NOAA's current forecasts show relatively light and variable winds should persist throughout much of the week, 
Yesterday's overflights continued to observe significant amounts of oil associated with convergence zones around the Mississippi Delta and Breton Sound. However, with light winds and weakening westward currents, oil is not expected to move significantly further westward during NOAA's current forecast period of 72 hours. Number two, on the loop current. We continue to track the small amount of oil that was entrained in the loop current late last week. Most of that surface oil is now caught in a counterclockwise eddy on the northern side of the loop current. And because the top of the loop current has now pinched off, any oil that was in the loop current will most likely be retained in the Gulf and not routed to the Florida Strait or the Gulf current. Three, flow rate. NOAA scientists are part of the National Incident Command's flow rate technical group, which is designed to support the response and inform the public by providing scientifically validated information about the amount of oil flowing from the leaked well, from leaking well, while ensuring vital efforts to cap the leak are not impeded. The official rough estimate of at least 5,000 barrels per day was based upon the best available information at the time. Only a few days ago did we receive from BP videos of sufficient quality to make credible estimates of flow. The technical team has been hard at work. Their work is undergoing rapid peer review, and we expect to have results available very soon. Four, fishery disaster declaration. On Monday, Commerce Secretary Gary Locke determined that there had been a fishery disaster in the Gulf of Mexico due to the economic impact on commercial and recreational fisheries from the ongoing Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The affected area includes the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Secretary Locke made the determination under sec Section 312A of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and this declaration was made in response to requests from Louisiana and Mississippi based on loss of access to many commercial fisheries and existing and anticipated environmental damage from this unprecedented event. Five, fishery closures and seafood safety. Yesterday, NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service modified the boundaries of the fishery closed area based on the latest oil spill trajectories. The modified area increased the closed area to 5,096 square miles. This represents 22.4 percent of the Gulf of Mexico exclusive economic zone. NOAA is actively sampling seafood inside and outside the closed areas and working with FDA to ensure that seafood is not contaminated and to guide decisions about where closed areas can be reopened. Six, NERDA. NOAA is coordinating the natural resource damage assessment effort within, with the Department of Interior as a federal co-trustee, as well as the co-trustees in five states and representatives for at least one responsible party, BP. The focus currently is to assemble existing data on resources and their habitats and to collect baseline or pre-spill impact data. Data on oiled resources and habitats are also being collected. And finally, scientific and environmental impact. NOAA is aggressively working with other agencies and non-federal scientists to understand where the oil is on the surface and below the surface and to evaluate the environmental impacts of both the spill and any associated mitigation efforts. To close, I would like to simply assure you that we will not relent in our efforts to protect the livelihoods of Gulf Coast residents and mitigate the environmental impacts of the spill. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Bierbaum. Thank you, Chairman Rahal and members of the committee, for the opportunity to discuss the Minerals Management Service's ongoing response to the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig. Before I begin my testimony, I want to express how saddened I and all MMS staff over the tragedy that began with the loss of life on April 20 on board the Deepwater Horizon and continues as we speak with the oil spill in the Gulf. Many MMS staff have worked their entire careers to prevent this kind of thing from happening, and we will not rest until we determine the causes so that we can do everything possible to reduce the risk of its happening again. Secretary Salazar spoke earlier about the Department's role in the Unified Command Structure, so I'd like to focus on MMS's role in the response effort. MMS has chiefly been involved in overseeing efforts to stop the flow of oil permanently, in establishing new safety measures for oil and gas drilling, and investigating the root causes of the accident. MMS response to this incident began immediately. MMS staff were on site at the BP and Transocean Incident Command Post in Houston on the morning of April 21st. 
The same day, AMMS established an emergency operations center at our Gulf of Mexico regional office in New Orleans. By Friday, April 23rd, we had posted additional personnel at the Incident Command Center in Houston, the MMS Emergency Operations Center, the Unified Command in Robert, Louisiana, and the Coast Guard Area Command in New Orleans. On April 23rd, MMS staff began overseeing BP's effort to develop an acceptable exploration plan for the two reef relief wells that can permanently seek the leaking well. MMS reviewed and approved all elements in the drilling application and required additional testing measures to increase the safety of the relief wells which will go as deep as the original well and reach the same oil and gas reservoir. Drilling of the first relief well began on May 2nd. MMS also continues to oversee BP's efforts to close off the flow of oil at the wellhead. BP is currently attempting a top kill procedure. As we speak, they're beginning to push drilling mud into the well at a rate that will counteract the pressure of the oil and gas, and then, if the procedure is successful, seal the wellhead with cement. All of these measures have been taken with the immediate oversight of MMS, and at our urging, BP is consulting the broadest possible array of drilling engineers. In addition to intervention at the wellhead, MMS also continues to oversee efforts to contain the oil flowing from the broken riser lying along the seafloor. The riser, excuse me, riser insertion tube tool has brought more than 20,000 barrels of oil directly to the surface and into a production vessel rather than polluting the ocean. Another priority for MMS is to determine the root cause of these events. MMS has begun a joint investigation with the Coast Guard under the formal Marine Board procedures. In addition, Secretary Salazar has established an OCS Safety Oversight Board at the Department to conduct a full review of offshore drilling safety and technology issues. Also, later this week, the Secretary will deliver a report to the President on interim measures that can be taken to improve the safety of OCS operations. These efforts will all support the Special Presidential Commission announced last week. In addition, at the direction of the Secretary, MS has taken several steps to increase offshore safety immediately. We issued a safety alert reminding all operators of the urgency of conducting all operations within the requirements of MMS regulations and with the highest standards of safety in mind. Our offshore inspectors made an immediate sweep of all deepwater drilling rigs and have now moved on to a thorough inspection of all deepwater production platforms. We have placed a temporary moratorium on the issuance of any permits for drilling new wells pending the completion of the Secretary's interim safety report to the President. This tragedy has made the importance and urgency of the Secretary's broader reform agenda for MMS ever more clear. The Secretarial order signed last week will reorganize MMS into three separate entities, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, and the Office of Natural Resources Revenue. Over the next month, the Department will develop a schedule for implementing the reorganization in consultation with this and other jurisdictional committees. Mr. Chairman, from the night of April 20th, MMS's highest priority has been sh to shut off the source of oil. I assure you that MMS staff across the nation are fully engaged in response efforts to this tragic incident as we strive to respond to the immediate effects of the blowout and ensure greater safety for drilling operations in the future. That concludes my prepared statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, the Chair does wish to thank all of you for your service, and we know that this tragedy has put particular pressures upon each of your agencies and yourselves as well, and we do appreciate the uh, sacrifices you've been making. Let me uh, ask my first question of uh, uh, Admiral Watson. Uh, as you made clear at, or as was made clear at last week's Transportation Committee hearing, the Coast Guard does not directly review the oil spill response plans that are filed with MMS. I think that needs to be changed. We should not just assume that these plans are consistent with Coast Guard procedures. I also believe we're going to need more response planning for each new well, not just relying on a regional plan. Uh, my question would be, would the Coast Guard have the resources necessary to review all these plans if Congress mandated it? In other words, what I'd like to see here is a better communication between MMS and the Coast Guard. I believe you should be talking with each other, about reviewing these plans, and not just relying upon assurances from the oil companies that if a bust were to occur, that all is going to be okay, we can handle it. That seems to be what's happened in this particular case. And it would appear that if there had been better communication beforehand between you and MMS, perhaps we could have, have, would have had a better response plan. 
yes, sir. I, uh, I think I agree with you uh, that there, we would need more resources for that kind of a program. Um, we do review uh, plans for all tank vessels and all non-tank vessels and put a uh, Coast Guard uh, stamp of approval on those plans. And when they're reviewed, they're, the, the review is integrated with uh, our knowledge of our own response uh, capabilities as well as those of the, uh, the response industry that's, that's out there that the companies who submit these plans are referring to in their plans. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, we have local area committees um, as well as uh, regional uh, response teams and their regional plans uh, to uh, know specifically what the requirements might be uh, were a certain quantity of, of oil to be spilled in a certain location. Um, so I think, um, I think there could be some improvement um, for the mobile offshore drilling rigs. Uh, if we were to uh, collaborate a little bit better with uh, uh, MMS on the uh, review and approval of those plants, um, it's hard for me to estimate, you know, the, the amount of extra manpower we would need to do that at this time. Mr. Birnbaum, Bern would you wish to comment on that? Um, yes, MMS is given the primary responsibility for reviewing uh, offshore drilling uh, oil spill response plans under the executive order dividing up the responsibilities under the OPA. We um, have made those plans available to the Coast Guard to review as well as are doing our own review, but I think that we are all learning from this incident that we would probably do well to coordinate more closely on, on the review of those plans. While many people may criticize the response to the Deepwater Horizon disaster, it, it occurred in the Gulf, which has a long history of oil and gas development and as such has an infrastructure in place to respond to incidents. I do not believe such an infrastructure is in place in the Atlantic coast, however, where oil and gas leasing is being contemplated, particularly off the coast of Virginia. Does the area contingency plan around Virginia envision responding to an event like what we were grappling with in the Gulf of Mexico? Sir, I am. Um I haven't reviewed the area contingency plan for Virginia uh, specifically, but my, um, I have a lot of experience in different parts of the country, uh, including uh, you know, Savannah, Georgia, I was there, Miami, Florida, San Diego, California. And in general, there's, uh, there's not a, an assumption that there's going to be an a open well uh, that is uh, emitting oil uh, continuously for um, over a month. Um, in any of those plans. And so uh, even in the Gulf of Mexico, that was not, uh, I don't think, an assumption that was built into the area contingency plans. Let me ask Noah and MMS. Uh, it has been alleged that MMS repeatedly approved lease sales, exploration permits, and plans, and development plans in the Gulf of Mexico without conducting the necessary consultations required to protect endangered species and marine mammals. Is this true? Um, under the Endangered Species Act, we have consulted with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We have one biological opinion for sperm whales uh, that governs our uh, activities in the Gulf of Mexico, and we conducted an informal consultation indicating that there were no other species for which they believed their biological opinion would be necessary. With respect to NOAA, NOAA has the lead on um, whether MMPA consultations are necessary, and I'll let uh, Director Lubchenco speak to that. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, provided uh, general comments to MMS on five-year plans, on their NEPA analyses and associated biological opinions uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and um, the, uh, I, think the, I think it's fair to say that uh, in our comments we have expressed concern about possible, possible consequences of oil spill on species at risk uh, but we have not independently evaluated the, or calculated the risk of oil spills, uh, and we have taken MMS's calculations about the estimated uh, likelihood of a spill, uh, and I think it is uh, appropriate to review the processes that are used uh, in, in doing that. 
So do you feel your recommendations, NOAA's recommendations, are uh, taken into account by MMS, uh, or are they just uh, put on a shelf? Mr. Chairman, we submit comments as part of a formal process uh, when they are invited. Uh, there is no formal mechanism on a routine basis for MMS replying back to us. When uh, invited, you're not required to submit such? We are required. Uh, so MMS prepares a five-year plan, for example. We provide comments on that five-year plan. And uh, in many cases, uh, some of those comments may be uh, incorporated into a decision or not. We do not have any authority in this uh, manner. We simply uh, are uh, in a position of providing comments. And MMS can use those comments as they choose. In some cases, it's pretty clear that comments have, in, have influenced a decision and changed things. In many cases, they have not. Nice diplomatic answer. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from uh, Louisiana. Yeah, first, I'll make a comment, uh, probably addressed to all three. But it's fairly clear to me that there was no, there was no gaming out of a deep water spill. And so, fairly clear about that. Um, secondly, I'm very frustrated, Ms. Lepchenko. I'm sorry. I'm from Louisiana, and we've been putting all this money into the mineral management services. Here I see your testimony in which you say, well, future research and development, the fate and behavior of oil released at deep depths. Then I look at my 2003 National Research Council book, Oil and the Fate of Oil in the Sea, and it says, MMS, Coast Guard, and NOAA should come together to study the fate of oil released into the sea. Now, this is 2003. The only thing, only thing we're going to add here is the adjective deep. But I gather, despite these recommendations, and granted, this is before your beat. Let's just, I'll be fair. Although I gather that, um, uh, you know, nothing's happened in the last year and a half, as far as I can tell. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm letting my frustration bubble out. I'd like your comments on that. Why are we still talking about, seven years later, something that in 2003 was recommended, and now we don't know how that deep water well plume is going? We don't know what its long-term effect is going to be. We don't know what those dispersants are going to do. I'm sorry. Any comments, Ms. Zichenko? Yes, Congressman. Uh, I share your frustration uh, that we have uh, not as much information about uh, the transport and impact of oil in the Gulf as we should. And so it really seems as if our spills of national significance have ignored the fact that as we go to the OCS, the, it changes the dynamic. And so that's why when I hear that there's a whole crowd of people out in the Gulf of Mexico with a great response, I'm thinking, you wouldn't need that crowd if we'd had better planning. No offense. But, you know, it takes more people to clean up a mess than it is if the mess doesn't occur. And so if we'd actually planned on the deep water spill, I have a sense that we wouldn't need this huge number of people and would have a better effect. That's just an editorial comment. I looked on your NOAA ship tracker. Now, best as I can tell, um, the Gordon Gunter arrived, I guess, in the last three days. The Pisces went to port roughly around Biloxi and hasn't been out. And then the Thomas Jefferson um, is out there now, but wasn't out there before. It seems like the NOAA research ships have been fairly late to the game. Why weren't they deployed right after, if we're looking at the plume, why weren't they deployed right after the spill? Congressman, each of those ships uh, was involved in uh, a particular activity, and we have repurposed uh, those ships, uh, turned them around, refitted uh, what they, that they need to do these particular jobs, uh, as rapidly as was possible. The Thomas Jefferson, for example. So I understand that, and I accept that. So why not contract with a private entity? Uh, we have, in fact, done that. Uh, we have reached out to our academic partners uh, and uh, utilized the vessels that they have. I think uh, we've also been contracting with uh, fishing vessels to help acquire additional information. Now, I'm told that for deep water, those are typically limited, that things like gliders or ROVs would be of uh, help. Uh, Woods Hole has an ROV. Has that been deployed? Are we depending entirely upon industry ROVs for the deep water analysis? Um, we have uh, had good communications with the research institutions that have ROV capabilities, have remobilized some of them to the Gulf. 
they have been... Uh, so there are research ROVs in the Gulf right now? Yes, sir, there are. There, there is one from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute that is in the Gulf. It's been in the Gulf waiting. Uh, it was our hope that it could be uh, taking data uh, in the vicinity of the plume and help us get better information on the flow rates, but that has not been the highest priority, and there was concern that I believe is legitimate concern about possibly interfering with the efforts to stop the flow of oil. Uh, and so those... Uh, that and other ROVs uh, are um, being considered to do other tasks in the area, uh, not simply uh, getting better information about the flow rate. Okay. Uh, Ms. Birnbaum, uh, the um, ad advanced drilling permit, uh, BP has released information, and as I discussed this with folks, one of the things it shows is, as we know, there seems to be a pressure leak may have been a seal, may have been the shoe. Um, their concern is now that the um, uh, mud, when they laid the cement at the end, just before the explosion, they evacuated all the mud, and it was only seawater providing downward pressure upon the bubbling gas. That's as explained to me by people who know far more than me. Uh, I guess my question is, did MMS have to sign off on that, or is that something that is within the flexibility of the decision to allow a drilling project? First, I can't speculate on what happened with this particular well while the investigation is going on. I've heard a lot of reports about things that might have happened, and I, uh, we've seen BP's account of it, but again, that's from one of the interested parties. We have a joint investigation going on, and, and the particular... No, the only reason I say that is because the ENC committee has released the BP document in which they show the diagrams. I, I agree. BP has given their version of the story. Um, however, I will speak to the general question, which is that the replacement of drilling mud with seawater is a normal part of the course of completing a well in order to keep the drilling mud from polluting the ocean. We require that it be brought back up into the drilling rig. The, it is not supposed to be done until the well is sealed and under control. If that was a contributing factor, then obviously that was not done in accordance with our regulations. So, so the ADP, you, I, mean, I don't know, I'm not challenging, I'm just asking for clarity. So the, the, AD, the ADP would have said, keep the mud in there until you've sealed it, and if it turns out the hypothetical is true, that they removed the mud before they finished sealing the cement, that would have been in contradiction to your normal operating procedures. To our regulations, correct. That's great. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the um, oh, paper, paper everywhere, and I can't find my questions now. Um, I'll yield back and I'll come back. Okay. Thank you. Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Fazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, I'm, I'm a bit confused, and, and this seems to fall in the jurisdiction of uh, uh, Coast Guard and EPA about the dispersant issue. Uh, it was a, a, an order, it seems to me, uh, was sent uh, to BP as saying uh, we want you to use, uh, to limit or eliminate the use of core exit uh, because it's uh, highly ineffective and highly toxic. If you look at the schedule of the 18 approved substances, it's one of the least effective and one of the most toxic. Um, and uh, substitute something else. Uh, BP uh, essentially ignored uh, that order and has continued to use core exit. Uh, the EPA has uh, said they're disappointed in the response. I mean, I mean, at what point can we just order them to do something in this case? Sir, uh, we, can, we can order them at, at any point. Uh, that's, the, that's the role of the federal on-scene coordinator uh, when it becomes necessary. The, the challenge uh, I think that we were having as a, a unified command there is the, the primary uh, mission, uh, and, it, and we hope it will be satisfied today through the process, is to shut this well in. And the, uh, the subsea dispersant, the subsea use of that uh, Corexit was uh, not only dispersing the oil, but it was also knocking down the, uh, the volatile organic compounds that come up from that well right into the area where uh, all these vessels are uh, working on the surface to cap that well. Um, 
And so we were, uh, we were convinced that we needed to continue uh, with those dispersant um, applications sub C. But, but I, I guess the question is, they did. They do have a hundred thousand gallons of uh, an alternative on hand, uh, something called Seabrat Number Four, uh, which can potentially degrade uh, one very small fragment of it to a potentially uh, uh, a potential endocrine disruptor. But there are a whole lot of other things going on with car exit that we know are very toxic to the marine environment, living things generally. And the question is. If we had concerns about the toxicity, and, and also CBRAT is considered to be much more effective as a dispersant, why wouldn't we order them to use that and then place orders for other things from the list which are even less toxic uh, than CBRAT and even more effective? Because their excuse is, well, we didn't order them and it would take them 10 to 14 days to get it to us. Now, if, if they fail today, we're now you know, a week down the road where they haven't placed an order for something less toxic uh, and more effective uh, that we might need over the next two months if they're, not, if they're not done today. So why wouldn't we have had them substitute at least the less toxic one in the interim since we expressed concern with that 100,000 gallons, which seems would have taken them through this operation today? And why are, don't we have in place an order saying, okay, we, you know, we're concerned about the, uh, you know, the gas reaching the surface and that. You use what you have, but we want you to place an order for one of these others, or this one, however you want to do it, uh, that's much less toxic and much more effective, and uh, as soon as you have an adequate supply, substitute it. I mean, it seems to me we're just not looking for it. We're going to let them coast another few days. You, I mean, this stuff is horrendous, so far as I can tell. I mean, looking at the EPA chart. I mean, it's the second most toxic of the 18. Yes, sir. I, I, I can't answer your question about relative toxicity. I can answer. Well, I'm just going from the EPA chart, yeah. and, I, and, and I'm puzzled that the EPA administrator, unfortunately, isn't here, says, well, we want to do our own tests. Well, you've already done tests. You already have the results. You've already got a, a handy diddy, dandy grid, and, but we're going to do more tests and let them keep using Corexit, which is at the really bottom of the, the barrel here, so to speak. And ExxonMobil and BP happen to be involved with the company that makes Corexit strangely enough. Right. Um, the, uh, the reason I think that they uh, use Corexit, uh, it, it has been used by far more than any other dispersant over uh, the history of using dispersants. Sure, and it's been banned in Britain, and it's 20 years out of, you know, it's more than 20, 25-year-old chemical. There are new compounds out there, but the, it, I, I understand. But the question is, so you don't, let, let me perhaps turn to Ms. Lubchenko then. Are you concerned about the toxicity of this stuff and what it's going to do to the food chain and, uh, and or also about this subsurface uh, dispersing of the oil and what that means in the water column? Congressman, I am concerned. Uh, and I think uh, the real concern is the total volume that, uh, of uh, dispersants that have been used. Uh, I think we do not have uh, any idea what the full consequences of that is. Uh, I think that we need to, uh, it's, it's probably time to take a good hard look at uh, the dispersants that are on that list uh, and what the protocols are for using them. Uh, I don't think that they, it was ever envisioned that they would be used subsurface or in this particular volume. And those raise some totally new questions. I think it is important to take into account that uh, dispersants in general are less toxic than the oil. And so this is a situation where there's no really good outcome here. We're starting with a really bad situation. And the question is, can you make it better? And we only have partial information uh, to make that decision. But if, if after today they are not successful in their top shot, um, it would seem to me that we would want to move with some more dispatch to determining what is the best alternative in terms of dispersants for the next two months until they can intercept this well. And I would hope that the Coast Guard would agree with that, and I certainly will be in touch with the AP EPA, because, I mean, we can just keep kicking this can down the road. They've got an interest in core exit. They can get an infinite supply of it from their company in which they have an interest, uh, but we know it's 
pretty bad stuff. It may be effective. It may have been used a lot, but it's been banned in Britain. There are other alternatives that have been rated both for their dispersal capabilities in certain conditions with certain oils, and there are many things on the list which seem to be much preferable to what's being used. So, Admiral, just yes, sir. I, I just wanted to say that that uh, that requirement has been placed onto BP to uh, they're uh, under an order that has been coordinated between uh, the Coast Guard and EPA to evaluate all the dispersants on the list. There's various problems of. Uh, yeah, I, I have their of, of delivery of yes, sir. That's it, and and there's and they're going through that list, and and we are going to continue to uh, press them uh, for another dispersant. Well, I've been contacted by one of the manufacturers of something that is rated as much less toxic uh, and much more effective, and that BP said, well, we would consider using yours if you will give us give Exxon all the proprietary information about your chemical. Exxon happens to be a competitor in this. So somehow we don't have the proprietary information about Corexit, and we can't provide it to the public, and we don't know what to look for in the fish and the shellfish and everything else in terms of toxic chemicals that are going to be in the food chain. But someone who wants to compete with them with something that is rated much less toxic has to provide them with all their proprietary information. I don't think this is a straight up game, and I don't think the response, you know, this was a, a non response, really. You know, and, and I, I would be insulted if I had ordered them to, to honestly evaluate alternatives, and I got this letter. And I would hope that the Coast Guard and the EPA feel insulted more so than the rather bizarre and benign response I've seen in the press so far. And I understand if the total focus was on today's top shot, you want to keep putting junk in there to try and keep the stuff from welling up to the surface, endangering the people who are working there. But I think, you know, if that doesn't work after today, you've really got to get serious about this in terms of what the alternatives are and not let them play games with you on it. Yes, sir. I, I agree. And uh, they, those same uh, sentiments were expressed in the meeting with BP following the receipt of that letter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A general lady from Wyoming, Ms. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, questions for Rear Admiral Watson. Um, there is a CRS report, Congressional Research Service report, um, that was conducted after the 2004 spill of national significance exercise that indicated that oil spill response personnel didn't e appear to have even a basic knowledge of the equipment required to support salvage or spill cleanup operations. There was a shortage of personnel with experience to fill key positions. Many middle-level spill management staff had never worked a large spill and some had never been involved in an exercise. As a result, some issues and complex processes unique to spill response were not effectively addressed, which is exactly what you want to learn during an exercise. That's a whole point of an exercise. So my question is, what steps have been taken since the 2004 exercise to address the concerns discussed in the CRS report and then the after action report? Uh, the, there, uh, I think the, the report was making reference to the fact that uh, we have fewer people uh, in the Coast Guard and in the uh, response community that have actually uh, been involved with large oil spills. Yeah. Um, the number of large oil spills has dramatically decreased um, since OPA 90, yeah. and therefore uh, you don't have those people uh, that have experienced the real thing. Now, uh, that's changing very quickly right now as we cycle people through um, and are getting the experience with the deep, uh, deep water horizon spill. But um, at that time, I think that was an accurate statement. Our exercise program uh, has been consistent. Um, it's mandated um, by law and by regulation. And I'm not aware that there's been any specific change to the regulations in order for us to have a, uh, an oil spill exercise that's meaningful. It has to involve all of the uh, uh, involved parties, which is state, local, federal, and a responsible party. Uh, we rotate the responsible party role uh, through the, uh, the oil companies, the uh, waterfront facilities um, that store oil and uh, any, any other entity 
um, that has large quantities of oil and has a spill contingency plan. So um, what we have tried to do uh, uh, since that report is to ensure that those exercises are distributed equally around the country so that um, if uh, CRS uh, goes to a, a place, uh, they will at least find that there is a, a, a certain level of uh, readiness and, and competency. Yeah, I, and I appreciate your response because the good news is there have been fewer oil spills. The bad news is there is very little expertise out there as a consequence of that that knows how to react and act accordingly. And uh, uh, so it has created, a, I think, a situation where we have this massive oil spill uh, of a, perhaps a lack of preparedness simply because of the lack of experience. What, what changes when a spill of national significance declaration is made? We, um, we identify, well, it is really the Commandant's responsibility uh, to identify who the national incident commander uh, shall be. And in this case, he, he selected to keep it at his level. Um, he could have delegated it, but it, it basically is a, um, a plan that moves the, uh, some of the authorities of the Federal Unseen Coordinator up to another level so that uh, big policy decisions and certain um, decisions that probably would uh, uh, be beyond a, a district commander in our case, uh, who is the uh, pre-designated federal on-scene coordinator, uh, who can manage things within a district but not at, at the national level. Okay. So a spill of national significance is really for the purpose of having a decision-making authority that can handle national uh, implications uh, in, in that decision making that goes on during an oil spill. Okay. Ultimately, who is in charge of this oil spill and this cleanup? Ultimately, is it the President? Is it a Cabinet Secretary? Who is the top person who is calling the shots on this oil spill? Well, certainly everyone involved listens to the President and uh, he is in charge. The, uh, the role of uh, being in command of the uh, oil spill operation is the National Incident Commander. Um, and then at the, uh, at the ground level um, in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, that is uh, Admiral Landry right now. Um, and she is uh, fully uh, in, empowered with the authority to make uh, most of those tactical decisions, and she does on a daily basis. Um, we, have, uh, we have certainly given uh, a lot of orders to the responsible party. Uh, we have also made decisions that involve the state and the locals and uh, other federal agencies. Do, does the Admiral contact the President on a regular basis? Do they speak regularly? Do they speak daily? A Admiral Allen is in regular contact with the President, yes. And, and then does she have... Uh, Coordinating authority over the Secretary uh, of Homeland Security, the Secretary of the Interior. How do those, how do they interface with the Admiral? Um, the, the Secretary of Homeland Security is on uh, daily phone calls. Um, she gets a, a daily report, I think, twice a day. Uh, she has been into the area. Um, she gets her information on a regular basis from Admiral Allen and is usually involved. Uh, every time there is uh, communication to the President. At, uh, at the area command level where I am involved with Admiral Landry, uh, we are constantly feeding information up to the National Incident Commander. Uh, he has a staff here in Washington and they distribute that uh, to all of the involved uh, departments and agencies of the Federal Government. Including the Secretary of the Interior? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so the, the Secretary of the Interior is, if you were put, to put together an organizational chart on the, the response team, uh, what would it look like? Well, the, uh, the individual secretaries and agency heads are still independent of the response organization. They are getting a constant feed of information. Um, there is a national uh, response team 
um, that is a, a pre-organized body to help facilitate that, and they're uh, being used every day um, in a teleconference uh, to ensure that that information is flowing. But we've seen all of the um, involved uh, um, administrators and secretaries uh, participating on uh, teleconferences almost daily and also visits to the site. As far as the actual response uh, organization, it starts with Admiral Allen as the National Incident Commander um, who has a staff, uh, as I said, to, mention, to manage these uh, national decisions. But he refrains from directing the oil spill at the uh, regional and local levels. Um, at the regional level, that's where the area command operates, Admiral Landry, um, and her area of responsibility in, in her normal assignment is the 8th Coast Guard District. Most of this impact is in the 8th Coast Guard District, and she uh, is very familiar with the, uh, the impacted area and the resources available there. And then the next level down is the incident command level, um, which uh, generally aligns with our sector organizations. These are the captains who work for the Admiral, um, and we have uh, incident commanders uh, in HOMA and in Mobile, um, and then we have a, another incident command in Florida that's at a much uh, lower scale right now because there really hasn't been any, any direct impact on Florida. And you've been very, you've been gracious, Mr. Chairman. May I ask one more question? And that is how the governor's interface with this discussion? At the incident command level and at the area command level, um, there's a unified command. So there's going to be a, uh, a federal on-scene coordinator, a state on-scene coordinator, and a representative of the responsible party with decision-making authority. Uh, those three people at each of those uh, two levels uh, are in continuous contact. Uh, they're they're co-located physically, and they move together, and they make uh, decisions together. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering uh, how they make a decision if they disagree, the, the Coast Guard Federal Unseen Coordinator has the 51% vote. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you for indulging my creative no, timekeeping. <laughs> thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be quick, knowing the Chairman won't extend the graciousness to me, but that's okay. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Director Birnbaum, uh, every environmental compliance document that's currently in place for every off offshore energy project in U.S. waters is based on at least in part on the effectiveness of blowout preventers. Now we have some new information. Blowout preventers are capable of huge failures proven in this case. The agency that is responsible and tasked with inspecting these pieces uh, has been in independent reviews uh, seen as far too cozy with industry and it raises and it raises serious doubts about the due diligence regarding uh, the inspection of these pieces so my question is so it's not so is it not clear that every single environmental compliance document, current, document currently in place for an offshore project needs to be redone from scratch? If we have based it on a premise, and there's some questions about the effectiveness of the agency itself. Congressman Grijalva, we have been um, reviewing every aspect of our safety regulations as a result of what we've learned from this incident and the potential causes of it. As the Secretary said, we're going to be providing an interim safety measures report to the President. He'll be providing that to the President tomorrow, I believe. That is not the end of our review of our regulatory structure. We'll be going forward to determine whether there are additional regulatory requirements we should include, additional inspections we should include, and so on, um, throughout every aspect of our safety regulation in the offshore. That will include a review of environmental documents. I can't speak to that at this point, though. Okay. Uh, just to follow up, Director, what, uh, last October, uh, M MMS uh, sent a letter to an environmental group, uh, the Food and Water Watch, explaining that MMS regulations do not require a company to have a complete and accurate set of as-built drawings for their seafloor components. They only need to have an as-built com 
documents. They do not have to be complete or accurate. Does this particular regulation make any sense? And uh, shouldn't we care about the accuracy of those? I actually think that's a little bit of a mischaracterization of what the letter said. I believe that what we said was that they are required to have those documents. We do not, in the normal course, review every document with respect to every platform for its accuracy. You and several other members have now sent us a letter asking that we make that review for the Atlantis platform owned by BP. We have been conducting that review. We ha I'm actually glad you asked about this because we had promised you a report on that by the end of May. Unfortunately, the team that was doing the audit of the Atlantis documents in Houston at BP headquarters um, had to pause for a while after this incident because the facility was being used for the response to Deepwater Horizon. We've now made arrangements to continue our audit of all of the as-built drawings for the Atlantis platform. And we are continuing that, but we will not be able to get you the response uh, as quickly as we had hoped. It's That's going to be true. delayed a couple weeks. In addition, I, however, I will assure you on an interim basis, we have at this point found nothing that indicates that there is a problem with the as-built drawings. And we have uh, conducted many safety surveys of the Atlantis platform, in addition to regular inspections of the Atlantis platform since it's been in service. Um, and so we have not found anything that would suggest that it needs to be shut in, as Food and Water Watch has suggested. I, I uh, for, for the NOAA director, with uh, with the existing technology that, that, that's out there, is there any way to deal with a, simul, a similar blowout uh, that, sh that, that could occur or, or should one occur in the Arctic region? Is there the technology at hand? Could we, could we deal with a blowout there? Uh, that's not really uh, NOAA's area of responsibility or expertise. Um, we do not deal with uh, those blowouts. Our responsibilities um, come into play. If there is a spill, then we help guide uh, attempts to uh, contain and mitigate the oil. So I would defer to one of my colleagues for uh, a response Remember. to that. Admiral? Uh, that's, that's something that uh, we clearly are concerned about. Um, it is uh, this sort of situation were to occur in the Arctic, uh, have the plans and the equipment and the training uh, been pre-established um, be so we don't have to invent it after it occurs. And I, I don't think it has. Thank you. And Director Berman, the, 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 last, the last point. In the, in the Clean Water Act, and, and uh, Congressman Markey spoke to, to another part of it, uh, the, there's a civil fine uh, uh, beyond the $75 million cap on compensation and economic damages. Um, the Act allows the government to seek civil penalties in court for every, uh, for every bar barrel into U.S. Uh, into US waters. Uh, that would end up I think the fine is $4,300 per barrel. Where is that decision, or anybody, where is that decision to pursue a civil recourse to uh, get additional economic damages above the cap? Uh, where, where does that decision rest? Who makes uh, I, I believe the Department of Justice is reviewing all avenues for civil and criminal penalties in this okay. incident, but they uh, won't make a determination on that until there's been further investigation of the causes. But that would be a question best directed to the Department Thank of Justice. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, let me uh, ask a question first regarding the Coast Guard. Um, within the uh, first seven days after the explosion, um, Admiral, how many Coast Guard vessels were directed to that area in the Gulf? Um, I, I think there was three, sir. Um, they, there was the initial search and rescue in which uh, there was at least two, and uh, mostly we were searching. Were those helicopters, helicopters or vessels? Yes, sir. Well, we, we could helicopter. reach that location from shore, right. um, from uh, Mobile and from Air Station New Orleans. Okay. How many ships were, were directed to that area? And there were, um, I believe, two uh, patrol boats. Okay. And then shortly after that, within those seven days, there was a 270-foot uh, 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 medium endurance cutter. Okay. 
now 37 days later, how many Coast Guard vessels have been directed to that area? Sir, we have a, a class of 225 foot uh, buoy tender which was built in the uh, early 90s following OPA 90 which is equipped uh, with skimmers. Okay, but just how many vessels? And there's time been so uh, a total of four different vessels of that class okay. operating at, at different times, no less than two at, at any given time. Well, having been in the Army, I, I know you can't uh, question an order by the Commander-in-Chief, but uh, let me ask you, was it your recommendation that uh, the administration do as it is now uh, put forward, and that is to cut the Coast Guard by $75 million, uh, which would mean nearly 1,000 personnel less, uh, five cutters less, and several less aircraft? Was that part of your proposal? Sir, that is uh, that is in the uh, 2000... Oh, I know it is. I'm yes, asking sir, if that I, was I'm your proposal. I'm not the budget officer of the Coast Guard right now. I'm okay. uh, the director of operations. But you think that's a good idea? I have no comment on the okay. budget, right. sir. Let me uh, go over to the MMS. Um, was, the, was the blowout preventer on this well tested within two weeks of it actually blowing out, malfunctioning? Uh, we believe that it was. Uh, you believe our, that it was. Our, Do you have the authority to check with people at the MMS to find out whether or not they tested this blowout preventer? The blowout preventers are tested by the operator, not by MMS. MMS reviews blowout preventer tests, sometimes observes them, but they're conducted by the operator and maintained in the operator's so documents. So if, if BP we have, says we've tested it, take our word for it, it's great then that's what you do? We have obtained documentation from the operator, but we observe some tests. We do not observe them all. But you take their word for it that they tested and... and um, they are required to maintain documentation of numerous testing requirements on drilling rigs. If, since we're not there every day, we don't observe every test. Well, and if they were to lie to that, us, they'd be subject to criminal penalties. Right. That wasn't my question. How many, well, yeah, there's a lot of criminal penalties that may go around here by the time we're finished with this operation. That's not the issue. The issue is what did whom do and when did they do it or not do it. And so I, I'm wanting to know, uh, is it true that BP was given a waiver of the mitigation plan for this kind of blowout um, by MMS? No, that's not correct. Okay, so they BPA had... BPA has an oil spill response plan for the Gulf region, which covers this kind of incident. And when this exploration plan was approved, it was approved with the knowledge that the um, blowout scenario within that oil spill response plan was sufficient to cover this okay, particular well. Okay, so you well were satisfied with the discharge. blowout response plan that uh, was provided by BP. I get it. We approved um, it. I will say that we are now reviewing what the standards are for blowout response plans and whether they ought to oh, be revised really? along with all our inadequate? other regulatory. Uh, we are reviewing all of our regulatory Makes standards sense. as a result of this incident. Well, now, um, the New York Times in their article about MMS said, quote, that it was an agency, quote, widely recognized as one of the most dysfunctional in government. And some of us that have, have um, either been in the Army or done different things for, for the government, we know, like for the last two nights, I haven't gotten more than two, night, two hours sleep either night because I had a lot to do to prepare. But as I understand it, the MMS is the only unionized um, a group within the Department of the Interior uh, I'm wondering, does the union have restrictions on how much travel these inspectors can do, how many hours a day they might can work? Um, I have no idea whether MMS is the only union within the Department of the Interior. I sincerely doubt that that's correct, and I actually do not know what the union rules might be, but MMS has rules for how much inspectors work and how much they travel. So is there a, you don't know if there's a limit on how much you're allowed to make them work or inspect within a given time? They're subject to civil service regulation, sir. Right. And as I understand, the proposal is to divide your agency and um, basically we'll get twice the government for twice the price. Is that what you understand? Uh, I believe that Secretary Salazar has identified what is an inherent conflict in the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, which requires MMS both to promote the orderly development of offshore oil and gas resources and guarantee environmental and human safety. Uh, what he has suggested is that 
the existing structure be divided so that actually there will be three entities. The royalty management system, which is uh, already separate within MMS, would move into the um, Assistant Secretary for Policy Management and Budget. The offshore safety requirements would move into a new Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which um, uh, would comprise some of the current employees of MMS and a separate bureau also under the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which would comprise another group of the employees within MMS. Um, that is an effort to separate those inherent, that deal with that inherent tension and now, separate uh, those you roles. You mentioned that before already and I appreciate uh, your answers and I see apparently our solution when something doesn't work is divide it and into three and make it bigger. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for uh, uh, Ms. Bourbon. Uh, this morning, Mr. Miller raised the important point that more than 40 years after the Santa Barbara oil spill, we are today still using basically the same methods and technologies to respond to oil spills. Now, I find this rather surprising and certainly unfortunate. The Minerals Management Service has had in place for over 25 years a technology assessment and research program established in part to improve our knowledge and technologies to detect, contain, and clean up oil spills. So I would like to know the following. If it appears clear that no new innovations in response technologies have been developed for more than 40 years, what has this research pro program been doing for more than 25 years? Congresswoman Bardayo, I would be happy to give you a list of all the studies that have been conducted by our uh, oil spill research program over the last 25 years. They've been extensive. They've looked at uh, oil spill travel. They've looked at fates and effects. They've also looked at technologies. We also uh, operate in Leonardo, New Jersey, a um, oil spill test facility that serves to train responders as well as testing new equipment and more recently has been moved also into testing renewable energy uh, devices devices, which also, it turns out, can be tested very well in that tank. Well, I understand that, but in all those years, you've never found something that would have attracted your attention to improving on the technology? Um, again, I can supply you with a full list of all the studies we've conducted. There have been some upgrades in equipment. However, I have to say I agree with Congressman Miller. We have not found something that will ensure that we can remove oil from water. Well, thank you. Um, Admiral Watson. Do you think that uh, cleanup technology and capabilities that equals the risk should be a requirement of exploration and drilling plans? Yes, ma'am. All right, and I have another question for you and uh, uh, Dr. Lubchenko. A 2003 report by the National Research Council predicted that the oil in a deep water blowout could break into fine droplets, forming subsurface plumes of oil. Now, given that this was a known outcome of a deep water spill, was the need to respond to these plumes accounted for in the area contingency plan? I'm not aware that uh, the area contingency plan in includes uh, a response to that plume, ma'am. You have anything to add to that, Doctor? Uh, I do not uh, believe that it's in there. I see. Uh, then I have another question for you, Dr. Uh, Lovchenko. The Coast Guard and EPA get annual appropriations from the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund to prepare for potential oil spills, but NOAA does not. Should NOAA have access to this fund to improve their response and recovery capabilities in advance of a spill? You are correct that we do not have direct appropriations from that fund on an annual basis. Uh, if we did, uh, we could utilize those funds for a number of uh, purposes that would be immediately, obviously relevant to this particular case, uh, including um, additional resource, uh, additional research to understand fate and transport, uh, to uh, enhance our capacity to respond uh, in circumstances like this, uh, and a number of other uh, areas that I would be happy to detail should you be interested in that. Have you asked or, you know, for these funds? Have you uh, requested funds? It is not part, uh, that's not the way it's structured. It's not something that you ask for. It, it, that was, my understanding is that the, 
um, that that was a decision that was made, that there would be annual appropriations from that to certain agencies and not to others. Uh, I have another question, uh, Doctor. Do we have any idea how repeated natural resource damages are assessed? For example, if an oiled habitat is restored and then a hurricane moves oil back onto that same habitat, will further damages be as, uh, assessed and recovered? Part of the natural resources damage assessment process <coughs> involves, <coughs> excuse me, um, evaluating the state of uh, public resources prior to uh, an event and then evaluating what impact has happened as a result of the uh, event and then determining the types of remediation or restoration that would be appropriate and then making that happen. Um, should there be a situation <clears throat> where there are multiple uh, stressors uh, on uh, marshes, for example, or other critical habitats, um, we would make every attempt to uh, evaluate the state of the system prior to the, a particular impact. When this um, oil spill, when the explosion happened, the NOAA scientists immediately mobilized to get uh, as much data as possible with respect to the state of many of the coastal habitats, uh, the marine species, especially protected species, marine mammals, turtles, uh, our fisheries, as well as take water and chemical samples for contaminants so that we would have the most up-to-date information uh, about, from which to evaluate possible impacts of the oil. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what the NOAA team has been spending a huge amount of their time and energy doing, is getting good baseline information. Uh, we have that. Uh, it is uh, current now because it's within just the last couple of weeks. Uh, should there be multiple um, stressors to those systems, um, <clears throat> That would be, uh, I think, taken into account in the assessment. Um, I have one last question for you, Doctor. Um, the Gulf of Mexico is home to several national estuarine research reserves and two national marine sanctuaries, which generally function as centennial sites to monitor and assess the health and the productivity of the Gulf of Mexico. What is NOAA doing to utilize these sites to track? and assess the impact of the oil spill over time, and why did the administration not specifically request additional funding to support greater observation and monitoring activities at these sites in its request for supplemental appropriations? We have uh, made a special attempt to uh, conduct the surveys that uh, are needed to get good baseline data for those NERS as well as for the sanctuaries. Uh, and have some ongoing monitoring uh, in all of those uh, to evaluate impacts of the oil. They are critically important sentinel sites. You are absolutely correct. Uh, they will be very, very valuable in helping us understand uh, the impacts of this tragic event. Um, the uh, additional resources to do that valuation and do surveys um, would certainly be, uh, but would be welcome uh, and would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being so gracious with the time. I'm sorry, Mr. Cassidy, you've already asked on this first round. I'm sorry. Let, let me recognize those not asked on the first round. Dr. Christensen, for now. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there will be more rounds of questioning? Sorry. You, do you anticipate having a second round? Uh, it looks that way. Okay. Well, Thank you. Um, I'd like to w welcome the witnesses. Dr. Lub Lubchenko, um, I want to follow up on a question that the chairman asked. The, the draft proposed Outer Continental Shelf Oil and Gas Leasing Program for 2010 to 2015 stated that if an oil spill occurred, habitat recovery would occur within several years, that no substantive reductions in finfish or shellfish populations would result and no permanent change in the population of marine mammals was expected. Your comment letter to MMS criticized the draft plan saying, quote, the analysis of risks and impacts of accidental spills and chronic impacts are understated and generally not supported, end of quote. 
but there's another quote. And you also said, the frequency of spills is understated in the plan. Those concerns seem particularly prophetic today. Did MMS respond to these comments in writing? No, they did not, but they would not routinely do so in the normal course of business. We would normally submit our comments and they would take them into account uh, as they deemed most appropriate. Well, did they change the draft plan to address the concerns? For the five-year plan uh, for the 2010-2015, there were some significant changes in the plan uh, that uh, we infer were a result of our comments because they were consistent with them, uh, but not across the board. There were some things that were changed and other things that were not. Ms. Birnbaum, would you care to respond? There actually hasn't been a subsequent document after that draft proposed program, which was produced um, uh, in be beginning of 2009. Um, we received the comments from NOAA. What we indicated is the areas that we will continue to consider in draft EIS, which will then produce a draft program. That draft EIS has not yet been produced, and the draft program hasn't yet been produced. We would anticipate that in preparing those documents, we would certainly take into account NOAA's concerns and actually further consultation with NOAA staff. Thank you. Um, I also um, wanted to ask Dr. Lepchenko, um, do you have any additional concerns or plan in place with hurricane season um, starting next week uh, on the trajectory of the spill? We are entering uh, hurricane season. It mm -hmm. does typically start uh, June 1st. Uh, every season is a time for uh, preparedness on the part of uh, anyone who is in the path of a hurricane. Uh, this year there are particular concerns because of the spill. Yes, and I'm specifically asking about concerns regarding the spill. We do not know uh, what impact uh, a hurricane would have uh, on uh, the spill uh, in terms of the nature of the interactions between the two. Uh, typically, uh, a hurricane in the Gulf would be much larger in size than the area that is represented by the spill to date. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there uh, may not be interactions and consequences. We just don't have enough information to evaluate that completely. And we don't know where the hurricane might be, whether it's going to be north, south of the spill. Exactly. But uh, I hope we're planning. Um, and do you anticipate that the closures in this fishery in the Gulf would have any impact on the annual catch limits that we are mandated to set in the other regions by the end of the year? Uh, are you asking whether... So we are... Um, closing areas of the Gulf mm -hmm. uh, where there is oil present uh, and in a buffer area around that taken into account where we expect the oil to be going in the next few days. Um, it's not yet clear how... But for example, if the, uh, I guess they have a red snapper in the Gulf and we have to deal with our red snapper. Is right. that going to impact the closing there? Could it have an impact on what the Car Caribbean region catch limits might be for the same fish? Um, we're watching closely where the oil is and where it goes, and uh, we, are, we are sort of staying on top of this on a day-to-day -day basis and are looking closely at that. I think it's too early to know for sure what kind of interactions there may be and what consequences might happen. Okay. Rear Admiral Watson, and these questions um, have to do with the um, conditions that have to be met for deep, for deep water um, uh, oil rigs. Um, on the, what is it, MODU um, certificate of compliance, the con in your testimony, speak to the conditions that were met by Deepwater Horizon. They had a valid COC, but it was based on the third compliance standard that you listed. Um, I'd like to know, is that the highest or the lowest standard? And standard two says that they must meet the standard of the country of origin of the company. And that would be UK and BP's case. And UK, I understand, has a higher standard than the United States. So um, why was it only um, 
reviewed at standard three and not at a higher standard, and would, are you anticipating that you will require higher standards at the 5,000 foot depth going forward? It just seems to me that that was a lower standard that they received their certificate of compliance. And maybe I'm incorrect. I, I, I think that may be a, a misinterpretation. There's, uh, there's one standard for a certificate of, of, uh, of compliance um, that is based on the international uh, maritime standard okay. for, for a, a vessel that's operating uh, internationally. You know, we have a, one we, of three conditions must be met, so, and that was number three. Well, I'm sorry, I'll have to get back to you with a, a, a more correct answer then, ma'am. Well, go ahead and, and give well, me Well, there, there is a, a domestic standard for a U.S. flagged MODU um, that would be slightly different. If, if it was not issued um, an international certificate, then it uh, would only have to meet the, inter the domestic standard. And there are some differences. Um, it, it depends on the specific area that's being regulated. Uh, for example, uh, the area of uh, electrical or uh, stability or um, mm -hmm. structural or fire protection. There's all those uh, different sub-elements of, um, of a mobile offshore drilling unit. And um, the standards are, are pretty closely aligned. Mm -hmm. um, and then there would be uh, deep water uh, rigs and then there would be shallow water rigs. Okay. All right. Well, uh, gentle lady's time has expired. I'll come back on the next round, madam. Thank you. I now like to recognize the gentle lady from California, Everybody Ms. Capps. Everybody more time than I did. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and for this long hearing, this long day. And I want to thank our panel, the third panel, um, both for your testimony but also for your service uh, at the site. Uh, you know, the, as the world has been riveted on. Uh, the events involving Deepwater Horizon over the past several weeks, it is clear that BP has not been uh, developing the technology uh, equal to the technology that they developed to get to the bottom of the ocean that deep and all of the complexities of drilling. At the same time, the technology infrastructure to deal with disasters was sorely lacking. And um, in fact, it, it, it appears that there's been a disregard for any responsibility okay, by this oil company forever. to develop any kind of contingency yeah, plan to, for their workforce safety or for any kind of disaster mitigation. Uh, Transocean has a document stating that the recovery rate of oil from floating boom rarely exceeds 15 percent. Those are the same figures that they used, and I know this has been referenced, uh, um, represent the Santa Barbara Channel. and. I was there in 1969, and those were the figures that were used then. And when I saw the boom let out, which was the same technique that we had below those 40 years ago, I, 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 my heart sank because I realized how limited this response was going to be given uh, the resources at hand. Um, so it seems to me that the role of recovery technology is one that the federal government must take on, clearly with the financial burden being borne by the oil industry. But clearly the federal government now has to rely solely on, solely on the deep water technology, which BP in this case has, de has developed, which now in itself pr proves to be a barrier for stopping the leak. So my question to you, uh, Director Birnbaum, is about the department and any plans that you might have to expand existing programs or to create a new national center that would consolidate scientific and engineering expertise in oil cleanup technologies to prepare for and to respond uh, to such kind of disasters. Uh, thank you. As I discussed earlier, we do have an oil spill technology program already. It is fairly small. Um, it conducts research on an annual basis on a variety of issues, but I think that the idea of devoting a significant uh, government focus on improved oil spill technology, oil spill cleanup technology in particular, is, uh, is definitely worth considering. Thank you. Well, 
I, uh, for one, pledge to want to work with you to support the, those kind of efforts. And I know there are many research uh, institutions with a lot of scientific expertise where we could tap uh, into those resources. It's absolutely shocking to me that the, a multi-billion dollar industry uh, has not been able to come up or not found it with, in their interest to come up with more effective strategies. So clearly this, this, this proposal that you are considering is something that I wholeheartedly support and would like to work with you in, in doing that. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, Dr. Lubchenko, um, uh, as, as um, BP works to contain the spill, uh, response efforts are underway which require access to all information pertinent to this spill. Uh, earlier this week, BP released live video feed from the accident site. Uh, this will allow scientists to estimate how much oil and gas are leaking from the pipe. While this is a critical step toward transparency, BP must release more information to allow scientists to track the transport and fate of the oil as well as the environmental effects of the oil both onshore and in the ocean. Um, they have been reluctant to do this, it seems. I have sent a letter to BP asking for them to make available to federal agencies, scientists and the public all data, records and physical samples pertaining to the chemical composition of the reservoir fluids. One of the scientists, Dr. Valentine from my institution, uh, UC Santa Barbara, has indicated an interest by his uh, co colleagues and himself in that this would be really valuable information for uh, scientists to have. Would this data on oil composition from BP uh, be useful to your response efforts in, in, in now or in the future? I appreciate very much uh, your focus on the importance of uh, transparency and sharing information in a timely fashion. Uh, and thank you for uh, your, your leadership on that. Um, it is true that uh, the uh, video that we received from BP early on uh, was of insufficient quality and length uh, to do um, credible scientific assessments and it is only in the last couple of days that we have gotten video that was high enough resolution, long enough length and fast enough shutter speed to really do credible uh, calculations. Uh, so too is it important uh, that they share uh, in timely fashion uh, all information that is available uh, to assist in our efforts. Um, we did request and received early on um, samples of the actual oil from this particular well. And so we do know the composition of that and have been using that to fingerprint uh, various, for example, tar balls that have washed ashore to evaluate whether they are from this spill or from another spill. And for example, the tar balls that washed ashore in Key West were determined to right. not be from this spill, and it's that fingerprinting that we yes. uh, were able to do. Uh, so we do know the composition of the oil, but we do not have all of the other information uh, that would in fact be useful uh, to do a much more comprehensive understanding uh, to which you are alluding. I look forward to more exchange along this line as we proceed in together with, uh, with uh, MMS uh, and, and NOAA. In yes, your area, time has expired. I thank the gentlelady from California. Now I'd like to recognize Mr. Costa, gentleman from California. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Mr. Birnbaum, um, there have been some press reports and realizing that uh, there's um, a lot of focus, not all of them have been accurate, um, but um, on how Mineral and Management Services relies on the American Petroleum Institute uh, to draft its operations and safety regulations. Um, what I'm trying to do is to ascertain what you believe the facts are in terms of how you develop your operations and safety regulations. Uh, does the American Petroleum Institute, uh, um, in fact, uh, do, do you incorporate their, their uh, uh, manuals uh, by, by reference or, or do you actually promulgate your, your own regulations? Thank you, Chairman Costa. The Minerals Management Service does formulate its Service does formulate its own regulations with respect to offshore drilling operations. Those regulations incorporated standards from eight different standard setting organizations, including the American Petroleum Institute, but also the American Concrete Institute, the American Steel Institute, and others. 
Um, we don't incorporate those as a substitute for writing our own regulations. For example, we have five pages of regulations governing what a blowout preventer is supposed to look like. Those five pages do have a couple of references to one API standard in them, but they are largely developed by MMS. At times, we develop regulations that go beyond the API standards. For example, we recently put out a uh, uh, regulation on safety seals, which uh, went beyond API standards for high pressure, high temperature seals. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, these standards, uh, and I don't know if you're able to, to comment, uh, but say the, the safety seals is, is, mm -hmm. is an example. Uh, is it your sense that minerals and management services and the promulgation of these regulations uh, attempt to set the highest standards uh, in the in the world uh, when you have comparative analysis to what you have off the coast of Norway or other offshore uh, uh, regulatory regimes by, with different countries? We attempt to set very high safety standards and it's very hard to actually compare them to other regulatory systems which are set up differently. Um, I will say that all of our regulations in addition to the fact that we review them independently are put out for public comment and um, we get public comment on what would provide the greatest safety. However, we regularly reject comments from industry that suggest that we should go back to just an API standard or uh, whatever. We well, that's good, and I'm, I'm glad that you clarified it. Before my time runs out, I want to get yeah. into the weeds on a couple of other related okay. issues to that. Uh, by the way, do you ever meet on a, uh, around the world for, with other regulatory agencies and compare notes? We have, uh, we have existing MOUs with several other countries on offshore safety regulation. We also do meet with the international body. We always send representatives. I might want to send some follow-up questions on that. Okay. Uh, as it relates to this specific well where this uh, tragedy took place and, 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 the, and the hopefully will be successful today, but there's been a, a comment that the British uh, uh, petroleum design was an inherently unsafe. Uh, there was a graphic in the Times Picayune that says a linear hanger was not placed between casings eight and nine. Drilling engineers say that it's highly unusual. Uh, there were other quotes in other papers that uh, uh, quoted deep water engineers saying the company would not use BP's design and that an additional liner would make things safer by a factor of tenfold. Uh, you care to comment on any, I mean, I've got a lot of graphs here, but on mm -hmm. these various comments by engineers? Again, I can't comment on anything specific about this well or this BOP stack pending the outcome of the investigation, but I will say that we're reviewing our regulations with respect to uh, well cementing procedures, casing procedures, seals, as well as BOP stacks, and um, as I said, some of that will come forward in the Secretary's interim safety uh, recommendations to the President, and beyond That's that, tomorrow. we will continue to review. Yes. Okay, and, and so we'll have those under the heading of lessons to be learned? Yes, sir. And what about the uh, displacement? Um, maybe this is another question you at this time can't answer, but when was MMS informed that BP was going to displace several thousands feet of mud below the blowout preventer with the lighter weight uh, seawater? Again, that's a question that I can't answer pending the investigation. The displacement of mud with seawater is actually a regular well, procedure because it prevents the mud from polluting the ocean. We require it to be drawn back up in the vessel. It's supposed to take place after the well is sealed and controlled, and so if it was done before that, then it would not be consistent with our regulations. Under these conditions, would it be normal to seek a, um, uh, an application permit to modify uh, under these circumstances? I don't believe so, but I'd have to check on that. Could you check practice. on that for us? Yes. I'd in have terms to of whether or not the, the, yeah. the permitting process was followed in the procedures that took place leading up to uh, this, this uh, tragedy? I'll check. And, and that would be helpful to the committee. My time's expired, and uh, Madam Chairwoman, I'll uh, uh, submit the balance of the questions to, uh, in written form. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like now to recognize the gentleman from Texas, the acting ranking member, Mr. Gomer. And I appreciate so much the acting chair. Um, let me go back, uh, Ms. Birnbaum. Um, I, I, apparently, I've gotten the correct information, the, uh, the only unionized branch of MMS is the offshore inspectors, apparently is the 
what I've been. I have to say, I'm not even sure that that is true. It may be. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, in uh, negotiations with what workers, what offshore inspectors will be doing, as director of MMS, do you get involved in any of those negotiations? I do not. Uh, who does that? Uh, that's done by the people who supervise them, the regional directors. Okay. Um, as the um, as the MMS is made into three new branches, um, will the union agreements be reconsidered, or will the entire new uh, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement be uh, unionized? Um. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement will likely consist of more than just the inspectors to begin with. Right, right. So That's I wouldn't anticipate that, as not all of the people who would move there are currently unionized, I would not expect it to be entirely unionized. The question of how the creation of the new bureau would affect union contracts is a matter for lawyers that has certainly not been addressed since we still have not sorted out the full division. Um, it's certainly an issue that will have to be addressed in the reorganization. But again, there's a timeline on reorganization due to the secretary in mid-June, and that will only set out the parameters by which we could begin to address that question. Yeah. Are you getting any input in uh, suggesting what should or shouldn't be done to avoid some of the current problems with the new three entities? Um, I have supplied input to the senior representatives who are putting this plan together. I will say the that I have not been asked. senior representatives of whom? Of the secretary. The secretary, the assistant secretary of policy, so management, and budget. So these are budget. DOI's three designated representatives that are putting together the three new entities, and as director, who would have seen things that were done right, things that were done wrong, you just got to make your suggestions to the three representatives. I actually think it's important that I not be one of the people who is devising the reorganization of MMS because I think it needs to be done by fresh eyes. They've interviewed not just me, but uh, virtually all of MMS's senior managers. They're going to be interviewing people in the regional offices. They're trying to collect all the information possible. And okay. I actually Well, think I understand that and I appreciate all the uh, Secretary's representatives are doing. But I can tell you what, if I had somebody I trusted that were running an agency of mine, I would daggum sure want their input on how to avoid the current problems. Well, let me ask you this, see if you have, uh, um, if you know about how this system works. But when the offshore inspectors go out uh, and, and inspect these rigs, you said they don't actually test, they just observe, but they require testing don't they require testing to be done in their presence? There is some testing that is done in the presence of MMS inspectors, but we require testing on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, on do a they monthly have the basis. Not all of that is done in MMS. Require testing be done in their presence? Yes, they do. Okay. And is there some kind of system among the offshore inspectors uh, that provides them the ability to review what other offshore inspectors have done just to make sure that someone hasn't missed something, as you, the term you use, so that someone with fresh eyes can see what other offshore inspectors have done to make sure they're doing the right things? The first thing is that, in general, MMS inspectors go out in teams of two, not alone, so we do have more than one set of eyes looking at things. Beyond that, we do rotate inspectors. It's not always the same inspector inspe inspecting the same rig or the same platform. They always have access to the previous inspector's reports as well. So the uh, duplicity of having two offshore inspectors at the same time go out and inspect a rig um, helps provide that uh, check and balance? It's one of the things that does, yes. Okay. Then uh, did, did you think it was a good idea at what has now been revealed from the Coast Guard MMS joint investigation that the last two inspectors of this Horizon, um, Deepwater Horizon, were a father and son pair? I mean, I know they're union members, but did you think that was a good idea, that father and son are working and watching each other, checking each other's back? Again, I cannot speak to anything with respect to the investigation of the Deepwater Horizon incident itself. Well, let's talk hypothetically. Hypothetically, would you think it's a good idea to have a father and son be the ones that are double-checking and being the fresh eyes on the other inspector? I would say it gives rise to questions. Okay, thank you very much.
I thank the gentleman from Texas. And now we're on our second round. I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a few, I think, brief questions. Uh, Rear Admiral, I guess this question would go to you, um, even though it's about health. Uh, there are reports of very severe health impacts from, in the workers on the Exxon Valdez, although what exactly it is is sealed, so we don't know for sure. But there have been other reports of long-term health effects and other, from workers and other spills. Um, have we learned from those responses? And what can you tell me to give me some kind of assurance that we're not going to be seeing long-term health effects in these workers? Well, we, we certainly have uh, become aware of uh, the long-term health effects of uh, dealing with oil, not just during oil spills, but people that are involved in, in the industry. And so safety is our number one concern. Um, every morning, every evening, uh, we get a report from our uh, incident commanders and the people that are actually uh, directly involved with those workers as to, you know, ha have there been any uh, safety incidents on scene? Uh, the monitoring is much better. Um, we have uh, a lot of EPA uh, air monitors and water monitoring. Um, the per personal protective equipment is much more readily available. Um, the challenge sometimes is to make sure those people wear that equipment. But someone is overseeing them yes, that knows what equipment right. they must use. Um, and so all of those things are in place. Uh, can I guarantee anything? I understand. No, no ma'am. Um, I, I can't, but I, I can tell you that it's a, it's a number one priority um, for our, our response organization. And, it, and I, I did figure out the... What, why I was asking that question. Y yes, ma'am. The, the numbers aren't meant to be any kind of uh, ranking of priority. Maybe one thing that um, I should note is that the, the uh, Deepwater Horizon is not a UK flag vessel. It's a... Um, it's a Marshall Islands flag vessel, even though it's owned no, by BP. It is uh, flagged in the Marshall Islands. And so uh, number one and number two n don't apply. Um, they have no standard other than the international standard. I got it. Thank you. Um, but the question to uh, Ms. Ber Birnbaum is, is similar, because there are other countries that have higher standards than the United States uh, for, uh, that have to be met for deep oil, oil well drilling. Is that like Norway and the UK, is that I'm not, not familiar with that, actually. They do have different systems from ours. One thing that's been reported several times in the press that we've determined is simply inaccurate is that they require acoustic triggers as backup systems for BOP stacks. We actually called the regulators because we hadn't understood that their okay. systems required that. This is getting, I'm getting it from media. Yeah, and they confirmed to us that they don't require them. They allow them as an option, which we also allow. I see. And... Um, and since you're overseeing the drilling of the relief wells, are, have you added any additional requirements in light of what happened? We have added additional requirements. BP volunteered some of them, and some of them we uh, imposed on them. Um, testing the BOP stacks on the rig at uh, the pressures used by the ROVs. They're tested on the rig normally before they go, are placed on the seafloor. But it's different testing to make sure that the ROVs can trigger them. Testing them using the ROVs on the seafloor as well. And also, um, they did test the auto shear device excuse me, the dead man device at the top of the stack, which is a slightly risky test. We would like to be able to develop a protocol for testing those devices that doesn't place the rig at risk because it, it, um, it has some potential impacts. But they did all that additional testing and are continuing to do additional testing as they drill the relief wells. Thanks. One, one last question. You said that uh, you had been inspecting deep water rigs in the Gulf, at, at least, and maybe elsewhere. Um, have you shut any down since... Um, we have, not, of April. Uh, we have not had any shut-in orders that I know of since the deep water uh, rig and platform survey was begun. I do know over the last year we issued uh, something around 100 shut-in orders from various uh, inspections, but we can sell to 2,500 inspections a year. So, Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the uh, gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, and now I'd like to recognize the uh, acting ranking member, Mr. Cassidy from Louisiana. A series of actors. 
Ms. Lubchenco, can you say for the record, for those uh, commercial fishermen who are still producing in the Gulf, that the fish that's coming to market currently is safe for human consumption? Congressman, we have a program in place uh, for testing seafood from the Gulf that has been approved by the FDA, and we are in the process of uh, aggressively sampling inside the areas and outside the areas with the goal of um, doing the appropriate testing so that FDA can make the determination about seafood safety. So if it's on the market, it's passed those tests and it's safe to eat? Everything that is on the market already uh, should have been not affected by the spill. Okay. One of the reasons that we are doing the fishery closures is to proactively prevent uh, seafood from getting into the markets uh, that might be tainted. No, I appreciate that. And there's just some people who do have good, good product which is not being bought because of perception. Director Birnbaum, there was an issue earlier with the Inspector General and her ethics violations, she could not draw a correlation between that and the frequency or severity of citations issued. And she said, frankly, ask you. Um, can you give us a um, statistics on over the last several years, including the period, but also currently, of uh, the number of citations and the, sever the average severity of them? Um, we can do that. I don't know. But we will look at the Lake Charles District and the relative number of uh, violations found as well as shut-in orders and give you some information. Um, uh, Dr. Luchenko, you, you mentioned that um, you you speak of what NOAA has done in terms of it, but then you also say that your, your research boats were deployed elsewhere and had to finish assignments and were not moved to the affected area until relatively recently. Was this with internal capacity that you were doing these studies of baseline, et cetera, or did you contract out, may I ask? Congressman, we mobilized uh, all of our existing assets in the Gulf uh, pretty much immediately to uh, be uh, available to do the different types of sampling needed. I myself was personally out on one of our vessels that was getting baseline um, seafood samples to get good, uh, good contaminant, good, good other levels to do the safety testing that we were just speaking of. Um, we also have contracted with a number of academic institutions, both in the Gulf and elsewhere, to redeploy assets there. Uh, and are working with other agencies uh, to do exactly that. As, so, a, as a state that's in the bullseye of the spill, there, as you might guess, a certain amount of suspicion of both the federal government response as well as industry response. Turns out my university, LSU, uh, which in the interest of disclosure, I still see patients through their hospital, they chaired the book that I quoted earlier that made recommendations that we're again making as far as I, when I spoke to their coastal and environmental folks who apparently have thick resumes of publications regarding oil in the marshes, they tell me they haven't been contacted by NOAA. And yet here's an expertise that has great credibility with the people of the state which is being maximally affected. Uh, any, any idea why not, why they haven't been contacted? Um, I do know that we have been in communication with many of the scientists at LSU. They are actively doing much of the testing of oil. Uh, we routinely send samples there. We routinely communicate with many of the scientists. Um, I, I, met with happy them, I met with them Saturday, and they do have contract work they're getting. Uh, they also tell me, by the way, that when they independently go down to the marshes, that their name is taken uh, and that they're informed that their results will be subpoenaed. I, they imply that was from industry. Uh, but that uh, individual research is going to be difficult to do if people are intimidated by the thought of having their um, records subpoenaed. One of the fellows that worked with Exxon Valdez, he said he still is not able to make to publish his research from Exxon Valdez because it's under a court order not to be released. Um, so one, I have a concern again that the people I'm speaking to, in contradistinction to what you're saying, are telling me, no, we haven't been called by NOAA, except for contract work we had pre-existing. When we go on our own, on our own check, we're intimidated, so to speak, by the threat of our stuff being impounded. Um, it doesn't seem a good environment for independent research. Any Congressman, thoughts? this issue came to our attention uh, in conversations with some of the academics who had pre-existing contracts with BP, and they articulated pretty much what you have just described. Um, we have been uh, working with BP uh, and have uh, told them that uh, we think it's appropriate for all the academics that are working on this to be able to freely uh, publish and share their information, and that's exactly uh, what we are proceeding with. 
Uh, thank you for that. Now, we'll also say that the fact that, again, if LSU is the one that's publishing all this, and again, they're chairing the committee that writes the book that now is the basis for recommendations that are being issued today, uh, and they haven't been called, and they tell me they haven't been called. Frankly, my paranoia starts to stir up. I've learned in Washington, it never hurts to be a little paranoid, uh, that uh, maybe they're not being called deliberately. Maybe there's a concern that the people who are in the state being most effective will draw conclusions which are inconvenient to uh, different parties who are involved. Um, that may be paranoia, but can you assure me that, that that is not the case? Congressman, I'd be delighted to um, find out the individuals that you think we should be in communication with. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we are working with LSU folks to convene a scientific summit uh, that they are hosting for academics uh, and other research institutions uh, from the region and, and elsewhere to meet next week to, to be, have a big science summit to understand what the science needs are, uh, what is actually happening already, because there's a lot of work that's underway, what isn't happening, what's needed, what the priorities are, and they have been intimately involved uh, in this. And so I, I know that we have uh, good interactions and communications with some of the experts at LSU. It sounds like we don't have all of them, and I'd be happy to uh, know who those are so that we can set, we can correct that. I promised the acting chairwoman that this is the, uh, my last question. Uh, Ms. Bordaglio brought up the fact that um, the uh, uh, plumes, well, we, people have recommended we study the plumes, but no one is studying the plumes. Uh, and I've understood from others, and that deep water, deep water and ultra deep is, is um, uh, a different animal, so to speak, and that we expect different behavior from the oil in the water. And yet you ask, have you studied the plumes? And everybody said no. And it begs the question, why not? Um, I didn't respond no to that, and I would actually respond that we are studying that very aggressively. Uh, but that is are... currently or previously? Is that since this happened, or is that from no... Uh, we, we understand it's an issue, so we're going to bring it back up and we're, go we're going to address this proactively. Uh, I'm not aware of any studies before this spill to follow up on those plumes, but I can tell you that at present we have ships out on the water that are actively trying to so characterize... So I guess my question, my question was why, why wasn't it done since uh, a couple of rookies in this business uh, understand that it's a concern and I can read from 2003 it's a concern, and the Norwegians apparently released gas to see what would happen, but not a depth quite so deep, so I know the scientific community. And yet the recommendations that U.S. Coast Guard, NOAA, and MMS do this in 2003 by the National Research Council of the uh, National Academies uh, has not been acted upon. Uh, again, as a state which is being terribly affected by this, and I presume that information would be helpful, I'm just asking why wasn't it? No, that it may be somebody else's beat, by the way. No, I think there's a lot of research that should be done. I think the, the reality is that there have not been resources to do all the research that would be appropriate to do in this. I know that from NOAA's standpoint, our Office of uh, Response and Restoration uh, has, uh, has its hand full responding to the some 200 oil spills that we respond to a, a year. I uh, have not had the resources to do the kind of additional research that would be appropriate to get at the very questions that you are answering. Those are yeah. important Director questions. Director Birnbaum, your, your thoughts on that? Um, I think that having appropriate research on the fates and effects of oil at all levels in the water is appropriate. We have conducted some studies and we've also worked with Norway to learn what they've learned from their studies. Uh, additional research is always useful. There's a challenge finding something that will behave like oil in water without actually releasing oil in water. Okay, thank you. I thank the gentleman and uh, at this time, I uh, wish to thank the witnesses for the time and for their patience today. This hearing has been going on since 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, I know you have many important tasks before you right now, and we appreciate you being here. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we will have some questions for you. Uh, and the record uh, will be held open for 10 days. Uh, if we have questions or you have something you would like to submit for the record. Uh, again, uh, I want to thank the members that were here earlier and uh, to thank our witnesses for the many hours that they spend in this hearing room.
If there are no further comments before this uh, subcommittee, the hearing on the Committee of Natural Resources is now adjourned. The Senate today is continuing work on a 2010 spending bill aimed largely at funding military oper operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. The legislation also provides $34 billion for...